Welcome to another episode of the Tom and John Show. This is episode nine, and we're joined with um, Dr. Ben McGraw. I'm John Kaminsky, associate professor at Penn State, and with me is also uh, Dr. Wachke. Tom, you want to say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. Welcome again. Um, professor Emeritus, uh, been around here too long. <laughs> <laughs> Ben, we have you um, with us today, and I want to give you a brief background, and then we'll let you get kind of going about ABWs. Um, I'll introduce you to the first. So you went to the University of Maine. I believe you're from Maine, right? Yes, I am. University of Maine, and then uh, came over to the dark side and turf, and did his MS degree at UMass with Dr. Vidim, and then his PhD with Albrecht at Rutgers, and then spent five years at SUNY Delhi running that program, and so we we feel very fortunate to have stolen one away from from a, another group, which is not always a good thing, but um, we're happy to have you on board here at Penn State. You started in 2014, um, just in August, I think, when it summer last year, and it's spent the most part, I think, just building up your lab and getting settled in, um, but now you're pretty much full-fledged into research. I keep seeing all of your posts on Twitter and, and everything that's going on, so what I thought I would do is um, turn it over to you and you can maybe introduce yourself a little bit better than I did, and then um, you know maybe tell us a little bit about ABWs and how widespread they are, and, and what um, the impact really is on the superintendent. Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me on here. I'm sure your reach is global here. I don't know if you have a counter of how many people are watching, but maybe You're just my mom. Zero right now. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I started in August, and, and that was a good intro after, uh, you know, working at SUNY Delhi for five years and running the program there. I, I came here, and it was uh, great to get back into having a formal research appointment and tried to hit the ground running. We had to get the lab up and going, which is no small task at any new job, but uh, we're in the thick of it, and I can imagine that everybody else is in the thick of it in the Northeast, just trying to stay ahead of the grass right now. But uh, we've just had a couple of big weeks uh, with annual bluegrass weevil, which we can talk a lot about because it is a hot button issue right now, especially in the world of turf entomology. So we're cranking right now. I've uh, got a you know a great uh, supporting cast here. Danny Klein, I inherited him as a research technician and. Danny's phenomenal. He's uh, a seasoned veteran, 11 years on the job, so that's a huge, huge plus to my program. And then uh, currently I just have one master's student on right now working on uh, some cultural uh, practices and their effects on weevil uh, abundance and damage. So uh, that's uh, some of the things that we're working on right now. We also you know, have our tentacles out into other areas like earthworm management which is always kind of surprising that that falls on the entomologist since they don't have six legs and hardened exoskeleton or anything like that. But uh, doing a lot of earthworm stuff, some ant, uh, and the caterpillar pests, which uh, I really haven't worked a whole lot with in the past. And then, uh, of course, the standard white grub um, problems that we're dealing with. So we're up and running. We're cranking. We're probably doing a little too much running. It's uh, seven days a week. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm even out there walk mowing, which is a dangerous thing, but my bananas are becoming lasers, so. <laughs> Probably really crooked still, though. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to be inviting me to mow greens at any tournament anytime soon, let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, the ants on my putting green out there, one of my putting greens is loaded with ants. Uh, you know, I went out there the other day, I had a nice visit with Rick at Penn State, you know, looking for some ant sites, and I remember your your plots got hammered last year, and and we just requested some material to take care of that. I went out there thinking that would be a great site, and it was pretty pathetic. There's hardly anything in there. I think we cleaned them up too well last fall. So you mean at my site? Yeah. Go out there today. It was loaded. They're loaded out there. Really? Well, we've got a good site out at LMRC. They that's the Tom, and you're probably familiar with this. They don't let the entomologists play it. Valentine Central. Yeah. I'm sequestered way out there in Valentine North out at LMRC where we have all sorts of good bugs going on. Oh, yeah. Tom likes it out there, so that's okay. Yeah. So I want to make sure that we hit the ABW thing. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, 
know, the, not the history of AEW, but where the problems have been, because it seems like it's spreading. It seems like it's growing in terms of its region. So talk us uh, through kind of where it is and, and um, what's been found out, I guess, in the latest research. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting because, uh, and not to get into the history of it, but we believe this insect to be a native insect, uh, native to the U.S., and yet what we see every year is it almost has this expanding distribution uh, much like an invasive insect would. So when an invasive insect comes to uh, a new region, it kind of spreads because it's not kept in check by natural enemies and its uh, native land. And so that's almost what we see with the annual bluegrass weevil. So it's kind of a mystery uh, why we see you know places like northeastern Ohio or now into the mountains of North Carolina, why all of a sudden we're having problems there. And if you look at the museum collections, you'll see uh, there's records of this insect uh, in places uh, like on the West Coast. And you would think if it's out there on the West Coast, there's lots of Poe out there. Why don't we see damage or why aren't there people uh, reporting that? So it either could be bad records and there has been a lot of reclassification of this insect. There's lots of different weevils that you can find out on a golf course. So there's that aspect, but what we do know is that the damaging populations are expanding outwards. So uh, right now, you know, in, in State College is a good place to be uh, kind of on the one of the western fronts, if you will, if you take a larger geographic area. Uh, but, you know, I think the interesting thing with this insect is what it's doing in, in new places or recently invaded places, uh, places like uh, Maryland or Virginia. Uh, we don't have a turf grass entomologist working in that part of the world, uh, and and there are some interesting things that it does. Typically, we see it being most problematic on annual bluegrass and the, what I would call the Met, the New York metropolitan area. And it you know it was long believed that it only attacked annual bluegrass. We know that's not true. That it develops quite well on creeping bent grass, but. The reports that I get and what I've seen in the field is pretty much from the Philadelphia area down, people will say that it's uh, almost more traumatic to creeping bent grass. So when I was a grad student in, at Maryland, I mean, that was 98, 99. We saw it on bent grass in Maryland on tees and fairways. It was mm -hmm. pretty dramatic, but I never did any work on it. So. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that's it's an interesting um, place to start studies. Uh, and I think we will start to explore things in that region about what 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 are these insects doing? How are, are we seeing a host shift going on where, uh, you know, it, it, we can't have a very long evolutionary history of having an insect damaging golf course turf grass. I mean, you think about golf being you know, late 1800s at best in this country. That's not a long time in insect evolution. So... Are these insects everywhere? Are we seeing speciation going on? You know, what are the similarity, genetic differences between uh, populations? So those are some interesting questions. And then the the, uh, the topic of pyrethroid resistance and the advent of multiple resistance where um, certain courses have selected for pyrethroid resistant populations, they now chew through other unrelated chemistries. So those, those two things, I think, are the, the biggest questions in ABW management right now. So tell us a little bit about the resistance issues. I know that when I was in Connecticut, we saw quite a bit of it um, in that Hartford area, and mm. maybe Rich Coles has done a little bit of work on it. Um, I know he has this kind of petri plate tester thing, but um, how, how widespread is that, and what are people doing to try and combat it if they have pyrethroid resistance anything? Yeah, I mean, the, the widespreadness is, is a good question. A couple of, uh, actually, last spring we uh, embarked on trying to get a, a idea about the prevalence of pyrethroid resistance in the MET area with particular emphasis on Long Island. Long Island is a really unique place where uh, the state of New York in general is, is tightly regulated for what you can use for chemical insecticides, and then Long Island's a whole other uh, layer, very uh, difficult to manage insect pests in that part of the world. Uh, so when you have limited options, and one of them being pyrethroids, especially in that area, people uh, tended to overuse them. They're inexpensive and they're effective, and that's a kind of a dangerous cocktail right there. So 
we looked in that area and we sampled a bunch of different courses as well as Westchester, New York, and Southern Connecticut area. And just a, a really um, quick and dirty kind of survey, uh, not an extensive stir survey by any means. What we saw is that uh, resistance was kind of all over the place. Uh, we saw you know, moderate to high levels. And when I say high levels, uh, we couldn't even get an LD50 on uh, the high end. We were using 30 times the labeled rate of pyrethroids in a petri dish where the insect has no place to hide and, and these insects were just dancing all over the place. So you can imagine the failure that they have in the field. So that's uh, one part of the story. The other part is when you select for resistance, uh, what we believe we're seeing, uh, which needs to be characterized a little bit better on an enzymatic level, is that this multiple resistance phenomenon where you apply an unrelated compound and that doesn't touch them either. And so there, there's a serious problem. So one, I don't really know the full extent of resistance, but we do find it in many different places. Uh, it's not just centered around uh, the epicenter of its distribution where they've had the longest history of controlling the insect. It's, it seems to be everywhere. Uh, we do see high-end, low-end courses both having uh, resistance issues and that's probably because pyrethroids are rather inexpensive so uh, even a low-budget course might uh, be selecting for resistance by uh, repeated use of that chemical class against the same generation. Uh, so, you know, the resistance distribution is interesting. The advent of multiple resistance is in interesting as well. And then the final one is what do you do once you get that? And that's, uh, that's quite a struggle. And you would think that some people just would move away from the pyrethroid. Some people who have pyrethroid resistance still choose to use pyrethroids, understanding that they're not getting very high levels of control. Um, but, you know, people are looking for, uh, mostly looking at other chemical classes where they can get maybe a 40 or 50 percent reduction and then combining that with repeat applications. So, I wish we were in a place where we could say we had great biological controls uh, that we could substitute or cultural practices, but this is a crown feeder and there's really no recovery from crown damage. So that's that's a big challenge that we have ahead of us in the next few years. So, uh, Ben, do you think, uh, excuse me, John, you know, you were talking about the evolution of uh, insects and how that leads to various multiple problems really including resistance. What about the evolution of uh, the chemistries that are around? Now when I started in this business chlorinated hydrocarbons is what we had and we all know the fate of them. <laughs> but we didn't we didn't have any annual bluegrass weevils or, or Harley grubs. We used to call it grub proofing every five years just slam down <laughs> some heptachlor or whatever it was. Never saw them. But I, I think in, in John's world too, like the mercury based fungicides, you know, it's a similar story you, where you'd get multiple years of, of coverage or control. Yeah. So we, you know, it's interesting because uh, our insecticides have um, become more selective and so we start to see things. I, I believe ants are becoming more of a problem because our insecticides have become more selective and they're not just wiping out everything, which is a good thing. Uh, and, you know, annual bluegrass weevil really has popped up in this time of the new age of chemistries, you know, in the 90s when we had the pyrethroids come on the market and the neonics, uh, and then the 2000s with the anthranilic diamides like acelaprin and ferrance coming on, uh, and doxycarb, uh, the provant. You know, so it, it, is it a coincidence that they become problematic as our chemicals have become more selective. Uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. I would also say that what we've overlooked, which we're examining in my lab, is the effects of cultural practices. Much like the anthracnose group, working group, uh, did as our cultural practices became more intense, then the disease severity became more uh, noticeable, I guess. And, I, you know, I think as we 
stress out areas as we mow lower or uh, mow and roll and do all these other crazy things that we do to have uh, uh, fast and firm conditions, are we encouraging, maybe not encouraging the weevil to be there, but is it making damage more noticeable? Um, you know, for example, uh, what were we mowing fairways in the 1970s at? I'm not, gonna, I'm not asking the two 40 year olds on this. Yeah. <laughs> what were we mowing fairways at in the 70s? Three quarters of an inch or higher, an inch? Oh, yeah, inch and a quarter. Inch and a quarter. So, you know, that might be just high enough where you don't see the stress. Uh, you know, manifest in, in damage. So there are lots of golf courses that I go to, and, and uh, you know, my time at Delhi in upstate New York, we had a college golf course where uh, we had many, many weevils, you know, enough to do uh, full population studies all year round, and they never treated for the insect, and I could find them all over, and yet we'd just never see damage appear. Uh, maybe they'd apply one insecticide application per year, broad spectrum, and, you know, we didn't see major flare-ups on the, the fairways or anything, but they weren't also trying to push it to the extreme. So, you know, that's a, that's a question I always get is, you know, why do I have damage and he doesn't across the street? And I, I do think it is, uh, there is an obvious a stress component to damage appearing. Yeah, I agree. So what are we golf course over the over the mountains? Have you ever been over a sky top mountain course? I, I've driven by it. I, it, it <laughs> it's interesting from a person who likes to golf. Well, it's a interesting place to play golf, but that's a Penn State superintendent over there too, and um, one of the uh, peddlers was. We were talking to Mike Stein, his name, uh, the other day. And they were just looking around for the, the weevil. And his course is, is young, so it's pretty clean mm -hmm. um, for the most part. Uh, the greens have, you know, that typical early dollar spot size uh, speckling of power and uh, mostly in ball marks and that kind of issue. And they got down and were really looking close and son of a gun. They were finding them in these little, little dots, and the bed grass surrounding it had none. Wow! So, it, you might take a little stroll over there and play golf and look at some of that stuff. Yeah, that sounds uh, that's interesting. I mean, you get another. I always get this question too, where you have a place like Sky Top that's very remote in a mountain. You know. Um, yeah. You know, Sinking Valley is another great uh, cooperator of ours, and we have some trials out there. And you drive down to Altoona, and you go over the mountains in this beautiful farmland. There's not short turf, uh, no. continuous short turf from State College or anywhere around. And you just wonder, how does this insect that primarily gets around by walking, how does it show up in these very remote areas? So... Uh, you know, they seem to be ubiquitous, and when you go out to a place that has the weevil, and, and we do lots of different types of sampling, but one of our favorites is the vacuum sampling because you're just pulling up everything on the turf. It is the dominant insect at this time of the year. I mean, you could you can look at ground beetles, you can look at uh, fungus gnats, whatever it may be. It is the most abundant insect that we find at this time of the year. It just seems like they're they're everywhere. So how do they get to these places without uh, flying great distances? Uh, it's, a, it's a it's a wonderment. They're uh, maybe they're migratory. Yeah. <laughs> they walk under the snow all winter. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's Canadian geese. I was going to put a grad student collect fecal matter for oh, there you go. To feed them weevils and see if they can go through their gut. They might. <laughs> Got the fertilizer bonus at the end game. That's right. <laughs> That's pretty good, actually. Um, well, why don't you uh, briefly touch on some of the research you're doing? You mentioned cultural practice. What are you guys doing in your lab um, out at LMRC? So uh, I I brought on board one of my former students from Delhi, Ben Suzuki, and he is uh, looking at mowing heights and uh, fertility interactions. I guess uh, on 
the abundance and damage uh, appearance of annual bluegrass weevils. So one thing that I did uh, when I came on board, Albrecht Koppenhofer, my former advisor at Rutgers, and I sent out a survey of uh, northeastern, well, eastern seaboard, really. Uh, superintendents, you know, to kind of gauge their problems, ask about resistance. Uh, but one of the questions that we had in there was something that I've always thought about is, uh, much like white grubs, we never see white grub damage in greens. And I have very rarely observed uh, damage, annual bluegrass weevil damage to greens. And when I have, it seems that there's a certain uh, threshold where we see damage. And, and in my observations, uh, I've never seen annual bluegrass weevil in a damage a green that was uh, less than uh, 150, so 0 0.15 inches. And it was fairly uh, close to that estimate from our survey. So we asked, what are you mowing your greens at? Um, you have damage in your greens, tee boxes, fairways, how many, uh, what season, stuff like that. And pretty much uh, we didn't really see any responses uh, much below an eighth of an inch. So what Ben is looking at is uh, we, uh, Tom Bettle and the crew at Valentine built us some uh, POA research greens last fall and they came in great and they look great right now and Ben's looking at three different mowing heights um, all the way down to a tenth of an inch, uh, a tenth of an inch up to 150. We also have some collar height at uh, 300 out of uh, LMRC. And, uh, you know, he looked through probably 100,000 tillers last week without finding any eggs, so he's a little disappointed. But that's graduate school, and I've got him up at uh, the Country Club of Troy today in Troy, New York. Uh, pulling out hopefully three to four thousand weevils to reinfest, but uh, we can see that they can pass through the mower. We we saw them at the 100 height. It it's my thinking that the frequency of mowing plus the height of mowing uh, we're removing a great deal. However, this is the, the green is the area that we see people spray six to ten times per year for annual bluegrass weevil. It'd be uh, interesting to know if it's there's a reason to to spray. So uh, that's what we're working on as far as Ben's project. Um, I've got some earthworm studies um, that we're looking at different uh, fertilizer, seed meal fertilizers uh, to expel earthworms. That's kind of exciting. Uh, and you know, some of the work that I did for my doctorate was using insect parasitic nematodes to control insects and we're looking at different studies uh, using different surfactants uh, to see if we can improve the persistence of these nematodes to make them uh, last a, bit, a little bit longer uh, so that we can have a biological control option that's a little more consistent. And then uh, the final thing is uh, that we're well, one of the final things. We've got a few more projects in that, but uh, one thing that we're interested in is uh, we're working with an outfit, uh, uh, the Scent Works, which uh, train beagles to sniff out different insect pests, so they're very interested in annual bluegrass weevils, so we're priming beagles right now, too, so hopefully uh, that shows some promise. Uh, uh, it's uh, kind of fun to work with another uh, order other than insects. What's, um, what would be the benefit if they just find them early? Um. Yeah, I mean, we've discussed this with uh, the group. So, you know, our part right now is uh, providing them with weevils so that they can train their dogs. And in my thinking, uh, you know, so one of the things about annual bluegrass weevil that does, it has people confused is that uh, we see a big population outbreak in spring and then smaller population curves throughout the year. So summer generation is less dense and fall is even less dense than that. And that's kind of counter to what we see with a lot of insects that come out in spring. They just ramp up their populations and they get higher and higher. Uh, so one thing that I was hoping that we could look at is uh, using these dogs to sniff out overwintering sites and see when the insect returns to overwintering. And there's some studies from the 70s that suggest that they possibly return to their overwinter. Some of the population returns in the summertime. Others stay out on the fairway. So lots and lots of questions about the biology of the insect that just don't make a whole lot of sense, but would be important to know for management purposes. So 
that's what I was thinking with the dogs, uh, and they would like to also use them to detect them, maybe spot treat on different areas of the course. It's a strategy, but yes, you it to the dog so it can actually, you know, get in. <laughs> uh, my fear is that they're going to get out there and they're just going to find them all over and it's just going to be maddening. They're just going to be barking all over the place. So. But it, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, I like, I like working with the bazaar from time to time, and that's uh, definitely different, so... From a practical standpoint, you know, superintendent watches this later. Um, what are your general? So, some of the doesn't say have a resistance. What's your recommendation? Do you typically tell them to do? Well, I mean, there's a couple of different approaches to that. Um, so, the traditional approach is you apply an adult aside uh, at half green, half gold for Scythia timing. And in state college, that was probably 10 days ago. Uh, and so that's the traditional management. It was always apply against the adults. Now with the advent of some of these newer chemistries, we have a, uh, quite a few larvicide applications. So there are some people that believe that you should just target larvae. And, you know, some of prob products are timed at different times uh, depending on the action of the chemical. So... You could apply a larvicide, you could apply an adulticide, or you could do sequential applications of both. Most everybody that I know of is doing sequential adulticide followed by a larvicide. Uh, so if you don't have resistance, there's a couple of ways that you could do it. You know, don't make it worse. You, some people stay away from applying any adulticide because the pyrethroid is an adulticide. So some people will say, I just want to go with a larvicide. Uh, other people will use different uh, chemistries other than a py pyrethroid for their adulticide. And, you know, it's there's no one approach that's going to work for everybody. You really got to factor in many, many different things. The level of risk that you're willing to take is a big one. So if I was hosting, uh, you know, a big event and I didn't want to have damage in June in the Northeast, I would be applying them to adulticide, and I'd follow it up with a larvicide. Um, you know, there, there are people out there who like to roll the dice and uh, don't mind letting a few adults get by or letting all their adults get by and, and solely going with a larvicide. It really all depends about the stress that you have on the turf and, and you know, really how much risk you're going to take on. The problem later becomes, and, and I think this is critical as far as resistance management, is what you do in the summertime. Because once we hit the summertime, that first generation of larvae become adults, and then they just pretty much lay eggs consistently. So you have an overlap of stages, and it makes control very difficult. So some stages are protected. They're going to get through. You just get into a cycle where you're just constantly... Applying insecticides almost like a, a fungicide rotation program. So that would be kind of uh, support of getting out there early and getting the adults. Um, yeah, I think right now is a critical time. Uh, right, the, the spring is where you really need to invest a lot of energy, looking for them, documenting where they are, and then really hitting your timings just right. And that what that does is that compresses the population. Some are going to inevitably get by, um, whether it's natural resistance or whether it's coverage. Some are going to get by. You're going to have some, but you're going to really, if you can really time your applications, you know, one application might even be enough. That that was the case about 10 years ago. One well-timed well application could get you through to the season, and uh, that doesn't seem to be the case in too many places anymore. So, um, last comments, I would say, what what do you think, I know you're doing some cultural work, what do you think that the future of the research is going to be? Where, where do we need to go from the standpoint of, I know like the Anthracnose Project, we have that multi, you know, component group that gets together. Um, how about for the entomologists, where do you think you guys can pull resources and put that? Well, I think, um, I think the Anthracnose group is a, it's a great model, and you know, I sat on that multi-state where we have entomologists and pathologists, and weed scientists, and uh, you know, and and what was done on the disease side uh, for annual bluegrass. So the anthracnose group was 
it was really remarkable and it really showed the importance of understanding the cultural practices but you know it didn't eliminate fungicide use and I think it's got to be the same approach with the insect we got to understand what the cultural practices uh, have and and that's going to be the focus of what we do because we have the facilities to do that uh, we're going to start chipping away at things like mowing height and fertility and possibly move into irrigation or growth regulation. Uh, so understanding what we're doing and its impacts on the insect, but we also need to look at integrating different approaches other than chemical. Um, you know, I, I am excited about a few of the biorationals that we've had in trial work already. Um, it's a tough thing to discover an insecticide. That's what I did after college for five or six years is working on the screen and, and you know, I'm optimistic, but I'm also realistic that it's not just that easy to conjure up uh, a new chemical insecticide. And it takes a long time to bring it to market. So uh, cultural, biorational, and, uh, you know, I still want to continue on in the biological control uh, arena as well. Yeah, um, I think that you hit the nail on the head for what we should all be doing, no matter what the pest is. You know, that kind of multi-pronged approach where you're looking at cultural, chemical, uh, maybe biologicals ultimately. It's, I think a lot of the companies that are, um, you know, traditionally chemical companies, the large ones, seem to be interest in that plant health direction and biologicals and right now for the biologicals even as it relates to fungicides it's usually some smaller groups that don't have the resources to do it and so then they just can't afford the research to get it done right. and so a lot of it's anecdotal I think maybe if some of the larger chemical companies get on board and actually invest some real money into trying to discover some of these I think discovery will be better um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if I were, it's tough. I mean, you know, and, and I do have a history of working for agrochemical companies. It's, uh, you know, turf is a minor player. You know, it's it's corn, cotton, and soybean. And um, so we kind of get the dregs of whatever is left over from the screen maybe. But if, you know, you could build your ideal company, it would be investing in biorationals as well as biological controls. Um you know, there's got to be incredible promise, especially in your side of uh, in pathology, that we just haven't discovered yet. Uh, but it does require a lot of funds and a lot of investment in those areas. But you know, I, I think one thing that uh, I want to model my program after is, you know, I always think about the lowest common denominator being what is the most restricted uh, places that we can serve. You know, places like um, Ontario or Long Island, New York, you, you gotta you gotta develop solutions for, for those people who have the greatest restrictions, and then build your program up from there. So it's it naturally includes some of these reduced risks. Um, but you know, a, a big aim of my program too is to reduce the amount that we have going out into the environment of our conventionals, but by either timing things well or seeing if we don't need to apply them to things like greens if we can't have an insect overpositing in that green. Yeah, no, I think that it's uh, you can basically spend the next 25 years, you know, for your program working. All, all these things we've discussed, you know, I mean, uh, how did they get here? Why are they spreading? All those things are interesting questions, but they're also not associated with the kind of grant money that this guy <laughs> Who wants me to bring in, you know? Right. I'm a small business owner and the university wants its cut, so. Yeah, you can appreciate that, but it uh, definitely makes it tougher. Uh, we just need, we need an insect pest that is going to be transmitting diseases to golfers. And then, <laughs> oh, yeah. and then that opens up a whole NIH funding and stuff like that. <laughs> just invent that. Just discover that and then... <laughs> I didn't hear that was one of your objectives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> develop some sort of communicable disease that can be transmitted by turf grass insects. Right. Well, I think that there's a lot of information that people can take away from this, and obviously there's a lot of information that still needs to be discovered. But uh, I, I'll wrap up, though, and uh, just 
thank you for, for coming on and kind of sharing the information that you're uh, discovering. We'll have you back after you get some um, of your data from you know, this year or next year with your grad student and maybe talk about some of the findings that coming out of it. But what I'll do is I'll start with you and then I'll go to Tom and um, just let you last minute statements or words or, or anything. Okay. Ben? Oh, last minute statements. Um, insect management on golf courses is not difficult. I think uh, I'm always impressed with how well superintendents manage diseases, which I find to be far more challenging. Uh, I think we tend to overthink things with insect management. And, uh, you know, these are simple organisms. Especially right now, while I'm thinking about it, you know, the temperature always plays a big effect in springtime. And knowing that these insects are uh, exotherms, they're cold-blooded. They're only as active as the temperature allows. Also, where we're going through this heat stretch right now, uh, they're really cranking up and, and developing rather fast. So, not anything that we're not doing. We just need to simplify our insect management. And we'll be all right. Hey, you got that trophy in that office? Oh, I do. It wouldn't fit in the cabinet. I've been polishing it all weekend while I get these tweets from my students at TPC Sawgrass. Look at that big. <laughs> Congratulations, by the way. Oh, the students were awesome. I, well, we just graduated a, a whole bunch of them, though. Uh, really, for my first class here, what, what an amazing group of students, really impressive, um, you know, and they put a lot of work into that, so hopefully we can continue on with that tradition, but... Uh, Got a high bar for yourself. Moving no, on. man, it's, uh, <laughs> we just need super, super bright kids enrolling all the time, so... Uh, it's a credit to you as well. Oh, thank you, but... And thank you for uh, sharing your insights today, because... You know, entomology is, uh, well, how do I want to say this? It, it doesn't attract everybody. <laughs> and the people that it does are so involved and, and highly passionate about what they're, what they're doing and what they're studying that uh, good things happen. So I'm glad you're on board. Let's hope. I just, uh, I need more graduate students. Those are the, the ones that solve all the world's problems. Yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. Okay, well thanks uh, Tom and everybody. I was going to uh, just mention, Tom, do you have anything coming up that you wanted to uh, promote or talk about? You got anything good going on? No, nothing uh, on the golf course side of things. Uh, most of my golf course uh, travel is going to be in the more stressful times of the year in the summer and then in the fall. So things are leaving openings for fishing right now. Our <laughs> last episode when we had Eric Irvin on, he was like, oh, I'm with uh, Darren Bavard fishing somewhere. <laughs> yeah. um, we had a good time this past week. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I will say a couple things. Um, one, my travel starts pretty soon. I think um, tomorrow I'll be in Philadelphia area for a couple days, and then home. And then my internships travel, uh, internship travels start, and so that's taking me all over the world. Um, so I'll just give a shout out to my Twitter handle, I tweet turf, and people can follow um, any updates and things that I'll I'll be giving out while I'm traveling. Um, I know I annoy the hell out of a lot of people <laughs> when I tweet about traveling, but um, it's one of the things that keeps me calm when you're in an airport and you, know, you have the ability to converse and communicate with people and, um, and just keep yourself busy when you're in kind of stressful environments like traveling often is. Um, what I also want to do is I'm going to screen share um, and I'll mention that we have... Our next episode is going to be on Tuesday with uh, Kelly Cope from Utah State University. I think I said in the last episode that she was at New Mexico State. I don't know why. I just had a brain freeze. But um, she's going to be talking about her work with um, the Alliance uh, of – what the heck is it? Uh, oh, Alliance for Water Efficiency. So she's kind of gotten into some things that are, aren't necessarily turf-related, but she's going to kind of overlap 
um, in those areas. And so being out at uh, Utah State, she obviously is very concerned about water and what's going on. And then I'll also mention uh, a bunch of upcoming episodes that we're going to have. We've been putting a lot of hard work, Tom and I have, into um, trying to get a good lineup. And so moving forward into June and July and all the way through September, we have Jim Kearns from NC State, uh, Gordon Kaufman from Brandt and Greg Brothers. Um, Matt Schaefer is going to be on talking about uh, his new role as a co-founder of On Golf, which is an exciting new venture for him. Um, Darren Davis, Frank Wong, uh, Rick Latin, um, all these people are coming on to talk about some of the things. And we'll have some new uh, people put in there as well once we start filling up our schedule. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of mention those things. And, uh, Ben, thank you again for coming on. I know that it's a totally busy time for you, so it was great that you got to an hour aside here and, and meet with us. And, um, and with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to sign off. And say bye. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.